Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Northwest Craftsman. I'm super excited because today we're about to be starting a series on a big project that I just got commissioned for and that is to make a conference room table out of maple and walnut. Now it's not going to be one of those live edge tables that you see everywhere. It's going to be a laminated table that takes a whole bunch of boards, brings them together. But before I even get started on building the table, I need to work with a customer to figure out what type of finish they want on it. Now we've already agreed that we want to get an epoxy finish on the top, but the customer is a little bit concerned that the maple is going to be a little bit too light for the wood that they have around. Now, as much as I abhor staining, that's one of the things that I think we're going to need to do because it's going to allow us to hit that shade just perfectly like the customer is going to want to. All right, today we're going to be talking about that staining process and I'm going to show you guys the samples that I'm making for my customer so that we can make a proper decision on what we want to move forward with for the table. All right, let's get started. So my plan is to use the maple that I already have on hand and the walnut that I just purchased, which by the way, if you're wondering what $400 worth of walnut looks like, this is what $400 worth of walnut looks like right now. I'm sure it's gonna go up in price later, but that's what it looks like right now. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a little bit off the end of both of these pieces and I'm gonna split it into five or six different pieces, five for the different stains, one for the control. So the five different stains that I chose aren't necessarily specific just to the names, but what I was trying to do is basically get a range of shades that we could be trying to stain this maple, all the way from the lightest possible stain that I got from Varathane up to about as dark as I think we would want to go with the walnut being right next to it, and basically everything in between that I actually could get my hands on. But this should give us a better idea of what we want to do, and the benefit to doing a hands-on test with each one of these stains is then I know exactly the stain that I need to go purchase in full quantity in order to stain the entire table. Before I stain these, I need to get everything cut up, so I'm gonna time lapse you through that real quick and then we're gonna come back and talk about the process. like I'm gonna do in the final product. I may go to 220 in the final product, but 180 should give me a pretty representative view. What I'm going to do is apply pre-stain to everything except the control, but before I do that, I need to label everything on the bottom so I know which side is the top so I can make sure that everything stays consistent. If you've never applied pre-stain before, the idea is basically you want to uniformly seal the wood so that when you put a penetrating stain on top, it evenly coats the wood and evenly penetrates as opposed to having spots that it can go in a little bit more easily. By and large, you want to just follow the directions on your pre-stain. For this Varathane, they said to coat it, let it sit for two to five minutes. I sat for about three minutes on mine and then wipe away any of the excess that's there. And then 20 to 30 minutes later, you want to come back and hit it lightly with 200 grit sandpaper because this is water-based you're going to pop your grain on this, which means that some of the grains in the wood are going to pop out because they've so soaked up a little bit of the moisture that's inside of the pre-stain. Um, in this case, I'm going to be waiting a little bit longer than 20 to 30 minutes, but that shouldn't be an issue because the grains should still be popped. They don't lay back down once they have popped. So go ahead and hit it in about 20 to 30 minutes afterwards to smooth it all out. And then in two to three hours, we should be ready to apply our stains.
So after coat one of the stain, here is how they look. Uh, it's really interesting to me because even though the gradient was pretty smooth all the way across the different stains in color, it's kind of amazing to me how much different uh, like red and green comes out in these different ones. I don't know if you can see it, but this one is very, very red, um, even though it was honey, I think. Yeah, even though it was honey and it just looks darker, it's very red when I put it on there. And then both of these ended up being a little bit greener. Both of these were light, but both ended up having a slightly reddish hue to them. So we'll see what it looks like when I get a second coat on all of these guys, because I think all of these are still gonna be just a little bit too light. Um, for a point of comparison, here is what the regular maple looks like next to it. So, I mean, it is definitely a subtle shift between them. Um, and if we wanna go subtle, we can always do that. Um, so, but I'm gonna throw a second coat on these guys and see how they do. It is kind of interesting though, how quickly it stained it, even though I only let it sit for about 30 seconds before wiping up the excess. But before I put on the second coat, I need to wait for two hours um, per the directions on the wood stain. So I will see you guys back in just a second. And there we go, after coat number two, they did get subtly darker all the way across the spectrum. I don't know how well that is coming through on the camera, but there is a little bit of a shift, especially when you bring the raw maple in, you can see how different they are, even on these lighter hues than the straight blonde white of the maple. So what I'm gonna do is wait a couple of hours again for these to sit so that the stain can dry. I'm going to then bond it to the walnut chunks over here so that we get the contrast that we're expecting to see at the edge of the table. And then I was doing a bunch of research when you're using an oil-based stain and you want to apply epoxy over the top of it, you need to wait until the stain fully dries. So I'm gonna wait a couple of days for these to sit, make sure that the stain is fully dry, fully cured, make sure that there's no way that we're gonna have a bonding issue with the epoxy. And then I'm gonna go ahead and cover everything with epoxy and they should already be bonded again to the walnut. So we should get to see what it would look like in the end. But because of YouTube magic, all of those processes are gonna happen here in just a couple of seconds. So I will time-lapse you guys through the bonding of this and then we'll come back after the epoxy and do a review to see how things look. and after nearly 48 hours of these guys sitting, I'm gonna go through and I want to hit them all with 220 sandpaper very lightly so to make sure that I don't disturb the stain too much. Um, but really I wanna try and make sure that I get rid of these guys right here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little tiny pencil mark. And that pencil mark came from when I was using the dominoes. Now the reason why I put a pencil mark when I'm using a domino is because you want to mark both sides so that you make sure that your domino mark lines up on both sides. Um, but I need to get that out before I finish it because I don't want pencil marks all over the final product. So I'm gonna hit this lightly with 220 and then I'm gonna come over with uh, denatured alcohol or mineral spirits, I need to double check. But I'm gonna come back through here and hit these lightly so that I can make sure that I'm peeling anything off the surface that is not stained wood um, because I want to make sure that that is fully clear for the epoxy to penetrate through. Um, but yeah, so 220, uh, hitting it with some solvent and then we'll come back. Oh, I am also going to clean up these edges. Um, I didn't make sure that all of these were exactly the same length and I want to clean these up a little bit just to make sure that they look a little bit nicer. So what you can see on these wet spots right here is the mineral spirit still volatilizing a little bit. I didn't want to go with something so volatile as say lacquer thinner, um, but the mineral spirit just takes a little bit longer to come off. So uh, overall on sanding it, 
it definitely got lighter. Um, that was one of the things that I noticed all the way through is that the stain is certainly at a surface level and doesn't go much deeper than that. And in fact, on some of these, you can see a little bit where I tried to get just the, especially on this darker stain, just get the pencil mark off there and it just went straight through the stain like that. So I'm gonna need to find another way to get everything aligned and stained if we're going to be going with the stain in the final product um, because that's not gonna work. That's pretty hideous on the whole. Off camera, I took the liberty of setting all of these up onto the uh, setup that I'm gonna have for doing the epoxy. But before we get started, we've got a problem. It is the next day and it is 43 degrees in the shop, which feels pretty balmy compared to the 29 degrees that it is outside, but I need to get a fire going so that I can get the shop up to temperature. Okay, everyone, shop is up to temperature, but as I was getting my epoxy ready to uh, coat these samples, I realized, I, or just came to the conclusion, I really don't like the quality that these guys came out to with the staining, with the little blotches and how much lighter this is. I don't think it accurately represents what it would look like on the table with the stain. So I'm gonna do something a little bit risky um, and try to stain these while they're already bonded. And the way that I'm gonna do that is just throw some blue tape across these boundaries and hope that it stays away from uh, the walnut enough that when I wipe it away, I don't bleed into the walnut, but we could be making a mess out of this. Worst case scenario, I just have to sand these all back down and then restain it because as you can see, the stain is only surface level, so I should be able to fix any mistakes that I have and try to hone in the method. But I really just don't like the quality that these came out to and I don't think they accurately represent what the table is going to look like when we get done. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to restain these today and then I need to let them sit again before I bring the epoxy out so that I can coat them properly. Okay, so I reapplied the stain and as I was concerned about with the blue tape, there was a little bit of bleed under um, all the way around. I know that they have like the frog tape, the green tape, which is supposed to be better, but I don't even want to mess with trying to keep the stain off of the walnut in the final table. So the most important thing about this test is that the hue is correct and you can see that it really brought back the vibrancy on the different colors and you can really see the shades coming through all of these here. So that's really the primary goal behind this. The rest of it is a construction or an order of operations mistake on my part so I'm not too concerned about that because I have a couple of different ways that I think I can get around any of the issues that I've had here um, but now that I've reapplied stain on all of these I need to wait for another 48 hours before I go through and try to epoxy it so I'm gonna let these guys sit and I will see you guys in just a second after 48 hours has elapsed Alrighty, 48 hours is up and now I've gone through off camera and wiped all of these down with a little bit of uh, lacquer thinner so that I could try and strip any of the oils that were just on the surface without touching the underlying color and the reason I use lacquer thinner is because I wanted it to volatilize a little bit quicker. Um, I don't think it's going to cause any issues like I had previously mentioned by using mineral oil so the lacquer thinner is just the volatile that I use to cut the oil on top. Next up I need to do the epoxy and you might have seen off screen over here I had some total boat tabletop epoxy but that's not the epoxy that I'm going to be using in the final table and so I wanted to give that one a trial run and in that case uh, I'm going to be using super clear epoxy. Let me get the jug for you. And here they are. So I've got a couple of gallons of this stuff so that I have it ready for the final table, but I'm just going to do a small amount um, so that I can test it on here. Okay, so to walk you guys through the process that I'm gonna be using here, I'm going to be doing two coats. First coat is going to be a seal coat, which is going to be basically just a hand spread thin layer all the way over the top of all of these. And that's going to sit for between two and six hours until I reach kind of a bar room floor tacky. Um, they literally describe it in the directions as tacky like a bar floor after a college party with beer. So if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, um, but a little bit tacky on the layers and then I can go ahead and apply the float coat over the top of that and that should be the final layer. Now underneath each one of these, uh, to my little tiny pedestals, I applied a little bit of packing tape. There's the packing tape. 
um, so that the seal coat doesn't stick to that and I don't end up with a, perma a permanently pedestaled uh, sample. So um, theoretically, I should be able to tear those off in the end. Those may be famous lost words, but we shall see. Um, so you're gonna do one coat, two coats um, after the two to four hour window, and then I'm gonna let that sit until it fully cures. So I'm not gonna have a lot of time to change perspectives and film a bunch of different angles when I'm doing this because these are pretty time sensitive procedures. So I am going to set you guys up and let you watch this process and I will get back to you in just a second when I'm between the seal coat and the float coat. Here I am for what's supposed to be between two coats, but I mixed an absurdly uh, large amount of epoxy. And so I ended up going with a much thicker uh, coat on the first one. We'll see if I can't do the flood coat. Some of the problems that I'm seeing right now, which are fixable, it just means I need to stay on top of it, is the uh, bubbles that keep coming up out of the wood because it just continues to keep soaking in. So I just need to keep hitting those with the torch. And then also catching all the drips that are going all the way around, which isn't really an issue. It just is what it is. Um, and if I can catch all of them as I'm coming through this process here, it will help to prevent me needing to heavily sand the bottom to remove those edges. Um, so I'm going to keep policing up all the bubbles, policing up all the drips, and I'll touch you guys or I'll touch base with you guys once I get done with this. And we'll see how well it turned out and what fixes or changes I need to do. Alrighty, and then five hours after that, I am going to end up doing a second coat for a couple of reasons. One, um, you can see in the areas where there were cracks, there's a little bit of a gap there where it actually shrunk into the cracks. Um, and then two, there are some areas where it's dry on the end grain, where the end grain sucked in all of the epoxy that I placed on there. So I need to go ahead and do another flood coat, and I am actually at the perfect time to do a second flood coat on this because it is just barely tacky on the edge right here and all the way around. I don't want to touch the top surface, but on a non-cosmetic surface, it is just the right level of tacky. Again, they say bar room after a college party with lots of beer, kind of tacky. If you know that kind of tacky, you know that kind of tacky. But I'm gonna go ahead and put a second flood coat on this guy and time lapse you guys through that. Um, I am anticipating, because we basically sealed the wood on this first layer, that there should be far fewer bubbles on the second one because it's not coming out of the wood, it's just whatever is in the epoxy. So I should be able to get away with it a little bit more quickly. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. flood coat done. I can already tell there's going to be a lot less bubbles in here. I did the first blast to kill everything and I haven't seen anything come up. I did have to dig something out of this side. Something got caught in the epoxy and so I very carefully took a pair of pliers, plucked it out, and then because I'm still in a very wet phase of the epoxy, I basically just repaired the surface right there with some fresh epoxy. 
Um, the program that I have right now going, um, I heard it somewhere online, but I don't think it has to be hard and fast, is that every 10 minutes I come through and check to make sure that there's no bubbles, so I'll hit it one more time. And actually, at this stage early on, I will hit it anyways because I'll find that there's a bunch of little bubbles that I can't even hardly see that will end up popping. Um, and then I'm gonna go through and police the drips off the bottom. They're gonna keep coming, but if I can get, them, get rid of them every 10 minutes or so, that'll help to keep them from solidifying onto the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I I don't need to have you guys watch me do that entire process, but let's go ahead and check these guys out tomorrow once it is fully cured. Okay, there we go guys, 24 hours later after that final pour and they feel very, very nice, definitely fully cured. So what I need to do now is pop all of these off their pedestals, which are here on the bottom, and then I'm gonna take you guys and show them all up close so you can kind of see what it looks like as I'm moving them around. Okay, there they are everybody. I am thrilled with the way that these guys turned out and it is so cool, especially on the walnut, how much that popped when I threw the epoxy on it. Um, I learned a ton throughout the entire course of this process, and I know there's going to be a ton of learning throughout the rest of uh, the building of this table. But to share with you guys, if you're starting an epoxy project, some of the really simple lessons that I learned in this case for things that went well and things that didn't go well are the following. Okay, number one, I already talked about this earlier in the video. If you're going to be doing it on wood, which I'm pretty sure everybody that's watching this video is going to be epoxying wood, you want to make sure that you do a seal coat, very thin at first, all the way across the wood, maintain the bubbles, watch the bubbles, make sure that you don't get um, a ton of those forming on the surface. And then when you do your next seal coat, you should get far fewer bubbles. I did not have to police bubbles on the second coat of this basically at all after that first coat went on. Um, so definitely do a much thinner seal coat than I did um, and try not to waste nearly as much epoxy as I did because that's an expensive mistake. Number two thing that went well, um, these pedestals. I was really happy with the way that these guys just popped off. It was absolutely a winning decision to put the packing tape on the bottom here. I don't know if you guys could see it well in the time lapse, but I was expecting to have to somewhat pry these guys off, but no, it, they literally just came right off of them. And then on the bottom, you can just see the little bit of the square where that guy sat. Now on the final table, that's not necessarily going to be an issue because I'm gonna have slots across the bottom of my table, which have a C channel on the inside. And I am planning on basically setting the pedestals onto those C channels. So I shouldn't get any of these markings on the bottom, but overall, Yes, packing tape worked phenomenally. And then also I was really impressed by that plastic bag. I ended up just throwing it all away, but the epoxy came right off of that as well. So I think in general, if you have something flexible that is plastic, the epoxy isn't gonna stick to it. So it's nice and easy to be able to peel it off. Okay, next thing that worked really well, this blowtorch, um, I just got the really cheap acetylene torch and I used the entire acetylene container and then I just hooked it up to the bottom um, or to the top of this uh, camping propane canister and that worked beautifully. Um, for popping all of the bubbles. You have to be careful when you're using a blowtorch like this. I did see it a couple of times where you start to smoke on the epoxy and that's because you're actually starting to combust it. But it does do a great job of reducing the surface tension, letting the bubbles escape. Or if you have a void that's not quite filling as you get later on, just really zapping it real quick with the uh, blowtorch really helps to just thin it out just in that spot so it seals up. Okay, and then lessons learned in this process. Uh, number one, any of the cracks that were in here bubbled like crazy. So right between these two pieces, there was a little tiny crack where it didn't form quite, uh, where I didn't bond it really well together. And that and this were my bubble disasters between the two. Um, besides having end grain on a few of the walnut pieces, those two are really hard. So if you have the ability to pre-seal cracks, I think it's gonna go a lot better. Okay, number three thing that worked really well is this adhesive spreader. This has eighth inch notches all the way across it. And on the second coat especially, it was so helpful for me just to be able to use this to spread more quickly across the entire surface, layer it on the side, pour a bunch of epoxy into that edge, and then basically scrape it up to get a nice even coat. Um, and then especially on the top, just do one final pass all the way across. And all of the lines that it left in the epoxy just bled away immediately as the surface tension brought it all together. But it gave me a very nice uniform finish. I am very excited to use these on the table as a whole. It should make our life a whole heck of a lot easier. Okay, so number two lesson that I learned is that I need to be very judicious with when I'm spreading, how exactly I spread, because you can see right here, point to it right here on this corner, 
I definitely missed just a little bit of the epoxy and you can see that visual distortion. There was a little bit on the other side as well. So I need to be really careful as I'm spreading the epoxy around because um, even though that adhesive spreader works well, I need to make sure that I'm getting even coverage because it's pretty easy to miss these. And if I would have caught it earlier, you can dribble a little bit of epoxy on it and it'll all bleed together and you'll be fine. Um, but I need to be more judicious and more careful about how I'm spreading so I don't get these spots. Okay, number three thing that I learned on this process, you see what happened on the front here? See those two little spots that are blonde or raw maple, or sorry, raw walnut here? Yeah, I think that came from either wood glue or something that was on my hands that spread to the walnut and it didn't allow the walnut to saturate with the epoxy, which meant that it still looks light when the rest of the epoxy is dark and that is a major blemish. So I need to make sure that when I come through on the table, I have everything sanded and clean and make sure that I go over everything and there is absolutely nothing on the surface that is going to cause an issue like this because in the final product, this would probably mean sanding it all the way down through the epoxy, reapplying the epoxy and then trying to build that back out. So that is an absolute no go. Really need to watch for that. Okay, the next lesson that I learned, I've lost track of how many lessons I've learned. I learned a lot during this process. You can see it right there. I have no idea what got caught in the epoxy, but something was there. I tried to peel out what I thought it was um, with a pair of pliers, but I literally, I don't know what this is. I think it's a bit from the first layer that came up. Um, theoretically, I should be able to polish that out or little tiny blemishes like that out if I go over the top of it, but that is a blemish that could potentially get stuck in the surface. So I really need to watch for those as you're going, as I'm going through on the final product. So really make sure that you don't have things dropping into the epoxy, which I don't know, in my shop is, oh, you can see how dusty it is on my lens. Yeah, so that's about how dusty my shop is. So there's all manner of uh, things that could potentially be dropping in. So I turned off all my fans after I had my filter running for a while. So theoretically it was as dust free as possible, but still I ended up getting something in the finish. So I really need to watch for those. Um, but also just, again, make sure that your shop is really clean before you start doing epoxy. Okay, another lesson that I learned, the bottom gets very drippy. Um, this is not the type of finish that I want to have on the bottom, especially, I mean, right here is fine because I knew that it was going to end up like that, but all of these drips, I really tried to police up the drips all the way through the process and still and ended up drippy all the way through. I was doing some research online and basically everything I found said, well, you need to kill the drips at the beginning where it, when it's curing, or you just need to sand, sand them down at the end. So I think what I'm probably going to end up doing on this is just taking on these ones. I'm probably not going to care. But before I do the final table, I will test some on this, uh, on these pieces with some uh, sandpaper to make sure that I can actually take this down and get a proper finish on the bottom. The bottom doesn't need to be the mirror finish like we have here on the top, but I do need to make sure that I can get rid of those so that when people are feeling the underside of the table, it's not this really rough, gross texture. Anyways, that is a ton of lessons learned and ton of tips that I got during the course of this process. But I mean, just looking at the way that these guys turned out, I am so excited with the way that these look. And I think that my client's gonna be super excited with them as well. The next step is for me to take these to my client and then we're basically gonna put them in the con conference room where the table is going to live. And we're going to look at all the other wood that's in the conference room and see which stain matches uh, the rest of the wood in their conference room the best. And again, the reason why I wanted to do this is because this gives the customer a really tangible way of visualizing what it's going to look like when the table actually comes in. Because if they're going to be spending as much money as they are on the table, I want to make sure that I spend a little bit of time up front so that they get exactly what they're looking for and they're really happy with their investment. Alrighty guys, thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate it. Again, I am so thrilled with the way that these guys turned out and I'm just, oh, it's just so exciting to me to see things coming together. So I'm gonna have a ton of videos coming out on this table or at least a handful of videos coming out on this table because this is going to be a massive learning endeavor for myself because I'm gonna be doing a bunch of stuff that I've never had to do before or doing things that I've already done but at a scale that I've never had to do it. So if you wanna see all of the lessons that I learn and all the ways that I screw up and fix it so that you guys don't do the same thing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and that notification button right next to it so that you get notified when new videos are coming out. So. Thank you guys for sticking around. I really appreciate it, especially if you're all the way this late in the video. It means that you're watching a ton of it. So I really appreciate having you guys around and uh, just love having you guys on the channel. So thank you guys tons. Happy woodworking. I'll see you next time.